I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Uh, AJ, when is this coming out? April 26th. I really enjoyed reading it. It's like my favorite topic in the world, and you wrote about it. So Aww, two of my favorite you, things, James. AJ Jacobs writing and a book about puzzles that even mentioned as a whole chapter on chess. A whole chapter on chess uh, that you were helpful with. You were uh, my consultant, if I recall. No, no. Cyrus Lakdawala was. I know, but he, yeah. You were the uh, behind the scenes consultant. Okay, I'll go along with that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, thank you. First of all, I'm enjoying the list uh, feature that you are doing. Oh, I good. Think that's great. Yeah. It is, uh, listen, if you ever need me to uh, be a guest on that, I am happy to anytime. Yeah. Make, uh, you know what you do? Make a list on notepad.com. Maybe we can make a list about the puzzler. Notepad.com, oh. N-O-T-E-P-D.com. And yeah. it's like Twitter combined with the ability to make idea lists and search other people's idea lists making lists every day. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. I'm going to join. Yeah. I am going to join. That'll be great. And also, I miss good or bad. So I'm ready to, I don't know how your schedule is, but after the 26th, like give me a week after the 26th or so, but maybe we could do another one. Yeah. I mean, the first topic could be puzzles, good or bad, because great idea. As, as you probably encountered in your so so the first thing people should know about you is that when you pick a topic to write about, you don't just write like this boring thing like, oh, here's the history of this topic. Here's some interesting things. Here's some interviews I did. You immerse yourself in the topic. Like when you wrote about genealogy, you broke the record for the world's largest family reunion. When you, right, when with you, you there as a speaker. I was, way. yeah. I was just talking about this with uh, with people the other day because I, I remember I checked in with my cousin, Dr. Oz, and uh, <laughs> George Church was speaking right before me, and he's like the premier scientist in genomics. And uh, and then uh, you had the band We Are Family singing on the stage. So I, I well tried done. to throw a good party for all of my cousins. Yeah, the point of that book was that we're all cousins. All seven billion of us. So I tried to throw the biggest party for all my cousins. We didn't get a hundred percent of the the seven billion, but we got a we got a few thousand, including James. Uh, but yes, you're right. That is sort of the way I I like to write by becoming a human guinea pig and going all in. So whether it's 
following all the rules of the Bible as literally as possible, from the Ten Commandments to stoning adulterers. And the, the year uh, of living biblically, where you actually did stone an adulterer in Central Park. Right, very small, like pebbles. I, d I didn't, don't want to give but, the right But an impression. act of violence nonetheless. <laughs> it is probably technically illegal. Well, he threw them at me first, if you recall. Uh, like yes. He was he was very angry that uh, I was going to stone adulterers. Anyway, that is uh, that is what I like to do, and and it's very I unique. Is, it makes it so entertaining, like that you're doing it. So it's not like it, it gives you a different perspective than someone who's just writing like a regular nonfiction book. Well, thank you. Yeah, I like to take the reader along on this adventure and this journey and then also have takeaways because I know from my friend James Altucher, you want takeaways in the book. You want to give the reader something that changes their life for the better. So I try to do combine the, the that with the, the James Altucher advice. And, um, and so this and one was, was oh, yeah. all about, again, one of my favorite topics, puzzles of all sorts. You have chapters on everything from anagrams, which are, you know, words that are, the letters are out of order and you have to figure out what the word is to math puzzles, to crossword puzzles, to mazes, riddles, chess puzzles, Sudoku and Ken Ken and Rubik's cube and, and so on. And that's an impressive, you've memorized, mem remembered all those. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I've been taking memory lessons. So, oh, yeah. well, they're working. Tell your teacher. <laughs> and uh, you immerse yourself in it. Like, tell, tell me some of the things you did, because I was jealous of every single thing you were doing. Like, I can't believe how jealous I was. <laughs> right. Well, the book is a combination of uh, sort of a history, my memoir of my lifelong love of puzzles, uh, these lessons you can learn of how to be a better thinker in real life, the secrets by using the secrets of puzzles. But for me, my favorite part is going on these crazy adventures to meet these wild subcultures. So I did everything from I went to Spain and represented the United States in the World Jigsaw Puzzle Championship. I went to the headquarters of the CIA and looked at one of the most famous unsolved puzzles in the world. Uh, I played Gary Kasparov in chess. To Why did he play you a game? Puzzle. Well, I shouldn't say that. He, we, we played puzzles together. Okay. So we collaborated, uh, and uh, and I went to the hardest um, corn maze and got hopelessly lost and frustrated. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was all of these wild. Oh, and the MIT mystery hunt, which is like yeah. the hardest scavenger hunt in the history of humanity. Just crazy. When you described one of the the puzzles, which you had the final answer for. So there's 150 puzzles that you have to solve in the scavenger hunt and you solved or helped solve one of them, but the steps it took for them, your teammates to come up with that were so ludicrous. I can't even imagine, like I always well, think I'm good was... at puzzle type thinking, but I can't even imagine thinking that way. No, this was, it was hilarious. The MIT mystery hunt is the Ironman triathlon for nerds. So what happens is every January, 2000 of the smartest people in the world gather in Boston at MIT and they're not kids. They're like, you know, real rocket scientists and doc, and they compete for 72 straight hours, uh, sometimes not sleeping to solve 150 of these insane puzzles that don't have directions. They make no sense. There'll be like one will be a fortune cookie and inside is a fortune with just random symbols. And that's the puzzle. Uh, and so I, uh, I joined one of the champion teams, which by the way is 50 people because you need that. These puzzles are so hard that one person can't solve them. You need someone who's like a surgeon, a brain surgeon who knows about you, that. You and literally need a surgeon on your team. <laughs> we needed because the puzzle that I worked on uh, was it was based on the game operation and it involved actually it was the grossest game uh, puzzle I've ever done. You had to look at at video footage of surgery, try to figure out what the surgery was. Oh, that's a gallbladder operation. Figure out the insurance a number for that and then do like eight other. Uh, oh, oh, OK, but that was the leap. That was incredible to me. Like, so, so you, you have a pic, it can't, it started, correct me if I'm wrong. It started with a picture of a body. Like mm -hmm. how, how did it start? So that particular one of the 150 puzzles, what, how did that yeah, start? Yeah, this off? one was called operation and it was sort of a riff on the, the, 
the old game operation. But instead of uh, when you pressed on uh, on the body part, a, f a footage of actual surgery would come up and you had to know exactly what kind. So not just that it's nose surgery, you had to know that it's, you know, surgery to get the polyp out. And so then only, you only a general surgeon, like, oh, you can't even be just a surgeon. You have to be like right. just recently graduated from medical school to know all those different types of surgeries all over the body. It's, I think we had several surgeons on the team, so that might have helped. And, and yeah, and then you had to make this conceptual leap to figuring out that you had to use the insurance number. Now, there was some sort of vague hint. I can't remember exactly in the instructions where it gave some sort of hint, but I would never have made that leap. And that's what I love, the mental leaps. I think that's, uh, and that's what you're good at. You talk about idea sex, where you take two different things like, you know, toasters and, uh, and space travel, and then you you mate them and it's a toaster uh, in space. That's interesting because uh, that's interesting because a lot of these, and I want to get back to this one riddle, like, cause it was amazing, but I mean, the one puzzle you solved, but a lot of the puzzles, if you think about it, are examples of idea sex, like two different, completely disparate notions or ideas or concepts that are combined together. Like that happens in crossword puzzles or these cryptics that you described, but okay, fin finish the So, so they basically take every operation for some reason, they find the insurance code for, they realize right. they need to find the insurance code for what that operation is. And then what do they do with the insurance codes? You know what? I have, I cannot even remember. There are like 14 different steps that you had to do. I don't know, some sort of quadratic equation with the insurance codes. And eventually every puzzle eventually solves to one word. And you have to send that word in to the evil geniuses who are running the hunt and say, and in this case, it was tra tracheostomy. It wasn't even tracheotomy. It was tracheostomy, which is a ver another way to spell it. And that turned out to be right. And I actually did help a tiny bit, but in the the sort of the um, the easiest way, I, I I used the wheel of fortune strategy. So there were all these letters that were there, and some that were missing. And I was able to say, hey, I think that this is tracheotomy. But yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. It was like, it, no, it was B underscore 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 K underscore G E, and you said blockage. Oh right, block because it wasn't even the final answer. It was like step three out of fourteen. Uh, but I felt I contributed. That's I, a contribution. You know, like point one percent. Your years of watching Wheel of Fortune paid off. <laughs> That's it, and I I love this event because uh, one of the contestants said, you know, his wife is saying, tells him. You know, these are some of the smartest people in the world, and they spend three days on these ridiculous puzzles. Why aren't they curing cancer? And he said, well, these are the people who are curing cancer to the other 360 days of two days of the year. These are their three days to get together and, and I think, practice their skills and become even better and more creative thinkers. That's one of the points of the book is that puzzles are great practice. They're not a waste of time. So, they so are... I, I want to talk about that because you can make many arguments about that. I mean, there's something primal about puzzles. People have been doing puzzles and riddles since the birth of our species. And, and before that, before that. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and you even refer to like, I mean, there's some kind of like religious element, like for instance, they're even like w one of the earliest Sudoku like puzzles is, are these magic squares where no matter, you know, it's a square, like let's say 10 by 10 or five by five. And no matter which way you add up rows or columns, they all add up to the same number, by the way, diagonals as well. I, mm. I just wanted to be, mention that because in the, in the book, I'm not sure you mentioned <laughs> diagonals. Oh really? But, uh, I meant to, but, uh, and then Benjamin, you, you show an example from Benjamin Franklin. He made this enormous magic square. I don't even know how he Crazy. did it. And, and cause he loved puzzles, but you mentioned how, like, even in, ancient Egypt, people would like wear these magic squares. Like there was almost like this religious element because a solved puzzle is, is almost like a form of enlightenment or nirvana, like a mini enlightenment. Oh, I love that. I, I, I guess I touched on that, but I, I love, I loved your point that it does, it does, it informs religion. It's in every part of human life. That's what I learned. So religion, certainly war, 
There's tons of puzzles in war, you know, secret codes. And, yeah, ciphers. Uh, cipher and romance. I love there were these stories of in uh, the 1800s, the people would, their version of sexting was to send secret coded messages in the newspaper classified. Uh, so that was the way they communicated. Oh, yeah. So they would say like, one was, uh, I have the most beautiful horse in in the land, but not the beautiful, most beautiful lady, and it's killing me in a sign, GK. And, uh, but it was coded in this, and you had to decipher it, and uh, who knows whether he eventually hooked up, whether it was a successful pickup line. But I love that it's woven into every part of our lives. And I think what you said is the reason, is because we're wired for it from this the dawn of history before history you know monkeys using a stick to get out termites that's solving a puzzle to me puzzle is anything where you use creative thinking to achieve a goal uh so i define it very broadly uh and and this one i just learned after the book came out so i don't i or after i finished writing the book that uh slime molds solve puzzles they solve they don't have a brain but they solve puzzles. So they are good at mazes. You put food at the end, other side of a maze and a slime mold will solve the maze to get to it. Now, will it solve it perfectly or will it make mistakes along the way and then back up and try other paths? I'm guessing it's more of a trial and error type thing. <laughs> so that would be amazing if they have like some... <laughs> <laughs> right, that would be good. Well, Well, it's interesting because, I mean, there's even... I mean, there's so many different directions to go, but... Uh, you know, puzzles are almost like a safe way to practice these real world difficulties. Like, let's say, you know, 40,000 years ago, you're living in the jungle. You don't know, you know, which direction is the evil tribes that will kill you, which direction are the animals that will kill you, which plants and trees have poisonous fruit as opposed to food, food that's safe to eat. So these are all puzzles that you have to figure out. Like, if there's a rustling in the wind, what does it mean? Is it wind or is it the tribe coming to attack you? And it seems like developing puzzle thinking by solving actual puzzles is like practice for the real world. And so maybe that's why we get these, like our brain cells, our dopamine rewards us for solving puzzles because it's going to help our survival. Like the better puzzle solver will, you know, his descendants or her descendants will live while the not so good puzzle solver, their descendants won't live. Exactly. If you want to survive, if you want to, uh, right, puzzles will save your life. But I totally agree. And actually, Paul Bloom, who you probably had on the show, great. No. Uh, oh, he's a great psychologist. He was at Yale. Now he's at Toronto. But he he's one of the ones I interviewed. Why do we love puzzles so much? And it's exactly what you say. It, puzzles are like play uh, for solving big life problems. And, uh, and he says play is so important. You know, that's why dogs, uh, young dogs wrestle with each other because they're, they're honing their skills. So when they get in an actual fight, they'll be good. So, and it's like what you say, you know, you, your vision informed a lot of this book because I love, you always say that you spend 15 minutes every day, whatever it is, brainstorming new ideas. And you said, it doesn't matter if they're good. It's that you are using the brain as a muscle so that when you do confront a problem, and I think the one you used as an example was, you know, you have a flat tire and you don't have a, a, a jack, what do you do? And that will help you stay creative. And same with puzzles. That's what puzzles are. It's real true because you could read about, like let's say you read an inspirational biography of somebody who inspires you and you see how they solve things. That's great, but it won't improve your ability to solve things. I, I realize that you have to actually do the thing that you're practicing to be better at. You can't just like reading how to be better at something will only get you like 1% of the way there or 2% of the way there. It's good clues, but it's not going to get you there. Like if I read about how to play better tennis, okay, maybe that'll give me some ideas when I play, <laughs> but you have to actually play to get right. better. And usually you have to play with a coach. Like when you do these, like the MIT puzzle, it, you're not playing with a coach, but you're playing with 50 people you're in, on your team who you're learning from. So that right. helps as well. And they are very aware. They have 
meta strategies that they think about, like, here's how we're going to attack this problem. We're going to break it into these chunks, or we're going to do it reverse engineer it. We're going to, uh, uh, you know, turn it upside down. And that was one of the great lessons of this adventure is I could use, like, this one was in the book, so you might remember it, but there's uh, a guy in a cell, 10 by 10 by 10, uh, and the floor is dirt. There's no, there's no way out, no doors, except there is a skylight. So he starts digging, and he's digging and digging and digging. Uh, and what is he doing? Why, why? He knows he can't get out through the floor. It just keeps going down. So why is he digging? And if you remember, the answer is he is building a, a, a hill because he's not just digging. He's doing the opposite. He's building a mountain. So you've got to look at this problem from the opposite. He's going to build a little hill and climb out through the skylight. Uh, and I use that type of thinking all the time, just reversing my thinking. Uh, I think it's it's how Henry Ford came up with the assembly line. You know, everything. people stay in their place and the car moves instead of the opposite. It's how, I use it even when I'm doing laundry. The other day I was picking up Instead of bringing the lawn the laundry to the hamper, I realized I have laundry strewn all over my apartment because I have three young boys. I'm going to bring the hamper to the laundry, and it, it will save me several trips. So that's just one example of creative thinking that puzzles have helped me. You see, and, and this kind of challenges your definition of a puzzle because, yes, creative thinking is required, but – and I'm talking about human-made puzzles right now. We'll get to other – computer made puzzles in a sec and maybe we won't get to it. We'll see. Cause, <laughs> but, but there's something very specific about puzzles is that there's an artistry to them where just going through the steps to solve something won't solve a good puzzle. So like if I have a math problem, you could say every math problem is a puzzle. Like if I have to do 685 times 572, you can argue, okay, I've got to think creatively to solve this problem. Um, but that would be wrong. Like puzzles aren't like that. Puzzles require some extra twist that does give you that enlightenment. Like you mentioned, and I'm not going to focus on chess puzzles, I promise, but you mentioned in that chapter, there, there was a, a type of puzzle called a grotesque and you were given the puzzle and, and you intuitively knew that, oh, there seemed to be like an obvious answer, but the obvious answer can't possibly be the solution because this is a puzzle, not just what's the best move here. So you had to find some quirky way to solve it. And, and, uh, I'll, if people want to solve it in your book, I won't say how you solved it, but you know, there, there's kind of like a clever twist in a puzzle. Like with the guy digging, it's not just that he's digging. You also have to think, what's he doing with this dirt? Because it's enclosed. He's has to be building a hill. Or there was, there was many examples of this throughout, throughout the, um, the book and now i'm gonna forget some of them but there were many examples plenty. where they like particularly in the cryptics you know where you're trying to find a word and part of the sentence is sort of a weird clue for the word and part of the sentence is the definition of the word right these are cryptics are like crosswords but eighteen thousand times more sadistic uh and they are all of, but yes you're i love that and i totally agree puzzles require some level of ingenuity, a twist, that's that's at the heart of a great puzzle. And I think that that's at the heart of great ideas. The, you know, that yes. is when you make a, a great leap. So like the mRNA vaccine, that was instead of, uh, you know, that was like instead of trying to recreate the entire um, protein, the entire virus, then let's just create a little part. And we know that that won't actually hurt us but it'll still stimulate the immune system. So that's like totally a novel, twisty idea. And uh, that's what I love. But yeah, I, I, I am glad uh, that you like the grotesque. Had you ever heard that, that phrase, grotesque? I, no, I had never heard that phrase. You know, and I've been solving chess puzzles since I was a little kid, actually. But I agree with Gary Kasparov, who you mentioned in the book. He doesn't like the grotesques because they're not going to appear in real games. And I sort of agree with him, but they're still fun to solve. 
you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, they just make me laugh. I never thought I would laugh at a, an arrangement of chess pieces on a board. But a grotesque is all 16 black pieces arranged in crazy, like in a corner, and then two white pieces. And you have to do it so that the that white wins. Uh, but Gary was great. First of all, he insulted me. That's how he, he started. That's uh, that. It, he he means well. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. He said I, I. He came over to my apartment and I had spent all day setting up and I had the chessboard all ready in an arrangement. And he got there and he said, "This is a very cheap chessboard." And I was like, "Oh, he's like, oh, so cheap plastic." And I was like, "I'm sorry, should I get another one?" And he's like, "No, I'm from the Soviet Union. I'm used to cheap chessboards." <laughs> so I guess I dodged a bullet. Um, but he. Uh, he talks a lot. I like when he talks about the long game and doing. Sometimes you have to do surprising things like sacrifice a queen. That is short term crazy, like the dumbest thing you can do. But long term, sometimes it pays off. Yeah, I mean, like you could you could think about every game is a series of puzzles. Like you're you're in a move in a game, and the puzzle is what is the best move I should take. And I'm not just talking about chess. I'm talking about checkers. I'm talking about risk. I'm talking about monopoly. Like given a set of choices, it's a puzzle. What, what choice should I make? And it's hard. Like every, every chess position is a, is a puzzle of sorts, but, and again, but there's a whole, like people don't realize like people like Vladimir Nabokov, the famous writer of Lolita and other books, he was, there was a title for it. He was a master of chess composition. He c composed puzzles and and achieved like a master ranking at it and it's a it's, yeah, a, it's an art form and that's what he said he says it's got all the elements of great art form it's got surprise and deceit and uh form and i can't symmetry who and, knows whatever he said and to win was, a game this, like any game of of any kind you have to do something unexpected like mm -hmm, if you to mm -hmm. play tennis to, to win a game of tennis you have to hit the ball on the other side of the court that your opponent was expecting. So, you know, that's right. a common way to, to win. And it's, it's difficult to do because as you get better and better, people expect, you know, they, there's a wider range of things they expect you to do. Right. And, uh, and I think that is one definition of games is that it's two people pl playing puzzles at the same time. And, you know, they each have their own puzzle and the uh, opponent is part of the puzzle. Uh, you can even I say, like. I wonder if you can even sort of define the, the quality of a game. Like, is this a good game or a bad game based on how, how many puzzles there are in the game? In other words, like take mm -hmm. Monopoly. Monopoly is a pretty good game, but sometimes, you know, you roll the dice. So that's an element of chance and you land on the square and you have to do what mm. the square tells you to do. So it's not like you have a puzzle every move. You only have a puzzle maybe on half the moves. And mm, yeah, but those puzzles though, will be instrumental in, in deciding like, you know, having a strategy for solving puzzles in monopoly is how you beat your opponents. Right. I guess, yeah, I guess most games have an element of luck and an element of skill and the skill part is where the puzzles come in. So if you've got shoots and ladders that has practically no puzzle except for like, how do I spin the, right. uh, the, the little spinner thing? So, um, yeah, but good games are all about puzzles. And that's kind of, the, I took it even further, though, because I, I started to see everything in life as a puzzle. You know, my marriage is a puzzle. This book is a puzzle. How do I put it together? This, uh, uh, your producer, Jay, was saying that uh, me assembling this mic was a puzzle because I was having trouble with that. And I love that. I love the idea of seeing the everything as a puzzle because you know why? It makes conversations. If you see a conversation as a puzzle instead of an argument, I find that not just more pleasant, but more productive. So if I'm talking to someone from the other side of the political spectrum, instead of trying to berate them and tell them they're dumb and tell, tell them, you know, look at, this, look at these facts, I, I treat it as a puzzle. Why do we disagree? What do we really disagree about? What evidence is there that we could change? Uh, what evidence could change my mind? Uh, so that, to me, is is one of the only ways out of this nightmare, this culture war, is to treat the uh, other people, treat the issues like a puzzle that you're solving together, that you are not 
trying to beat the other person down. Yeah, like, uh, uh, you know, if you think about it, let's say you're arguing with someone in some debate. Again, you both could take logical approaches. You both have your reasoning. Some of it, you know, if, obviously, if you're on the other side of someone else, you think some of their reasoning is ridiculous, but they don't. And how do you how do you push forward? And you could use puzzle-like thinking. A, what's something unexpected that the other side did not think mm. of, for instance? B, what's my end goal here? Is my end mm. goal to defeat this person so he changes his behavior or she? and Or is my end goal to be friends with this person, in which case I might not fight as strongly? Or is my end goal to learn something or maybe just, you know, so in, in a puzzle, you often think of, like a jigsaw puzzle, you think of, what the final picture looks like, and then you put the pieces together accordingly. If you didn't have the final picture, it would be much more difficult. You know, in chess, you think of what does the final checkmate look like and how could it occur, and you work backwards from that, and so on. So, yeah, puzzle-like thinking could make you a more interesting conversationalist because you have to think of something different to bring up. Yeah, I love that. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, 
I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily Fantasy Sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. By the way, I love that idea of what is the goal and working backwards. That I used in tons of puzzles. And that is one of the big, here, let me give you one. You might, you might know this one. So Probably not. Uh, go for it. Pretend you don't. Uh -huh. Pretend you don't. It, well, you don't have to pretend. But it's a famous story of the mathematician Gauss, who was, uh, I think, in the 1600s, maybe 1700s. And he, um, his teacher, he was at school, and his teacher said, uh, all right, everyone, the assignment is to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. And uh, he, he paused for maybe 10 seconds, and then he raised his hand, and he says, I got it. And the teacher's like, what? That's, that's impossible. You're a liar. And he says, no, I got it. And what he did was he did a strategy that was unexpected but much more efficient and clean. So do you... Do you know what strategy he used? Yeah. Um, because, okay, I know the thinking process. So like, let's say you're adding up the numbers from one to 100. It's going to be 99 plus one exactly. plus 98 plus two. So it's a hundred times. Uh, 101 because you do one right. and a hundred. So it's oh. 101, 99 plus two. So right. you're so at it's n, times n plus one divided by two, something like that. Exactly. So it's 50 couplets each adding up to 101, which is 5,050, which is not that hard. And so what he did is instead of doing the expected, like one plus two is three plus three is six, 
uh, he stepped back and said, is there a better, he said, what is my end goal? My end goal is to add up all of these numbers. Is there a better way to do it? Is there a shortcut? And he realized, yes, there is. So I love that. Don't just, when you see a puzzle or see a problem, don't just dive in and start grinding away. Like pause, step back and say, is there a faster way to do it, a better way to do this? Yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating because like, if you think about it, the teacher told him, add up all the numbers, you know, from one to a hundred say, and if you follow that literally it, you do think, oh, of course, one plus two plus three, and you kind of go in order, but he had the insight or, or the kind of the practice to not always go in order or not take too literally, uh, what people are saying. And you have to, right. you have to not take too literally things in order to solve puzzles. If you literally take the clues for a crossword puzzle, you would never solve a crossword puzzle. Yeah, a good crossword puzzle is a good crossword puzzle. And this is a big debate in the crossword community. But a good one is to me is not like what's this river in uh, in the Czech Republic and <laughs> someone is leaning on their horn. That is a, not a good solution to a problem, I don't think. Um, but they uh, to me, uh, a good crossword clue is all about word play and and that's actually uh, Will Shorts, the New yeah. York Times editor. If you ask him what is his favorite clue, it is a wordplay one. It is um, uh, something like, uh, this turns into a different story. This turns into a different story. This and the into, answer that's, that's is... That's the clue. Hold on. This turns into a different story. But see, these are really hard. Like, I always have yeah, trouble one. with these. these well, you know, of... this is a lot. I mean, it helps if I give you... It's two words... They both start with S and they're kind of longish words. So think of another, what's another meaning of story? That's what I, you I immediately- I was gonna say like a skyscraper or something. Yes, exactly. That's so the answer? What, oh no, no. Okay. No, but that is the right meaning of the word story. So if something turns and you step into a new story on oh, something oh, that uh, turns- Yeah, like and a it staircase is, or something. Yes, that's it. Oh, okay. But what kind of staircase? One that Spiral goes, staircase. Spiral staircase. You got it with no help at all. Well, no I did help get help. I did get help. You, right, you were, you were egging help. me on. You were, you, you were, you were giving me <laughs> clues. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think with Will Shorts, since he became the editor of the New York Times crossword puzzle, it's been a lot less about trivia and how much you know about celebrities and literature and more about uh, wordplay. Right. Which, which is, I, I really don't like. I really don't like crossword puzzles because I don't have, I don't want to know about all these cultural artifacts that, you know, the crossword puzzle creator makes. And some people love it. I, I just don't. Wait, so you don't like the, the wordplay or you don't like the trivia? I don't like the trivia. Oh, and yeah, and no, even a lot of I the agree. wordplay involves knowing things about mm, the world. So I like right. puzzles that are self-contained. So Got it. like, I don't have to know anything about the world to, to play a Sudoku puzzle, for instance, right, or, right, right. or, or, uh, or, or to solve a maze or to solve a jigsaw puzzle. So whereas wordplay, even with simple wordplay, you kind of have to know, uh, other things. Yeah. It, well, that's such a great point. And I will say I have not been a fan of puns for most of my life, mm -hmm. But this year, I mean, puzzle people are so obsessed with puns. In fact, I went to a puzzle themed wedding where they had traded vows like, um, I can, can promise you that you will always amaze me. And it was like, oh, so it was <laughs> a mixture of groan and like, oh, uh, but here's why I gained a little respect for puns is because they remind us that the root of puns is that one word has multiple meanings and to be aware of that when you're just reading the news is so important because otherwise you can be tricked into. So if someone is talking about freedom, you know, freedom means a hundred different things. So freedom could mean the free market, but freedom could also mean freedom from monopoly. Uh, and you know, if you have a total free market, it might end up in a monopoly. So you've got to be very careful. And, and that's what puns help me just be wary of the English language. Uh, it's so interesting because like l taking something serious again, and again, this idea that getting good at puzzles is practice for real world things. Take the U S constitution. It's one gigantic puzzle. Otherwise mm. we wouldn't have all this entire 
we wouldn't have a Supreme Court that is constantly needed to correctly or incorrectly interpret the Constitution. Like that's their job is to basically take this wordplay that we call the Constitution and in, interpret it for modern times in a, right. constantly. That's what they do all day, every day. That's a great one, yeah. Uh, and what can I give you some of the more painful wordplay that yeah. I uh, yeah. that I, I came across? Well, this is the British crosswords are especially known for their painful wordplay. So, for instance, a clue might be just these letters: G E G S, gegs, G E G S. And uh, I don't know if you remember that from the book. I think I mentioned it in the book. I but, I, I don't remember that one. Well, that's good because then you'll have. I mean, for me, I spent. Again, it's all about changing perspective. So I spent all of my time like, what the hell is a gag? And I even Googled it. A gag is... Is that the only clue? The, G-E-G-S? That's it. And, and the answer well, is wait, two wait, words. Wait, what's the, what's, the, what's the premise of the puzzle? Like, what are you supposed to figure out? Well, it's just a crossword. It's filling in spaces. So G-E-G-S is a clue for the answer is two words. The first word is, I think, nine letters. And the f- second word is four letters. And that's and all you know. Is and, that's and, all and you the got. GEGS is a clue. Is the only clue for two words. One is nine letters. One has four letters. Right. So, I think it's nine. Someone else can yell at me if I got it wrong. But uh, and it's a wordplay thing. I don't have to know like some British historical fact. No, that, no. This one is wordplay that you would know. Most uh, my kid, my you know, a four-year-old kid would know it. It is. Um, I won't tell you the answer, but the key is you can't. You got to get out of this gags. You know, gag was, I looked it up. It's the airport code for Portland. I was like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? But you have to totally abandon that way of thinking and just look at it from a whole new angle. And you realize, well, let's look at the lot of gags. Like, okay, let what? me ask you a question. Was, yeah. was it, were the gags capitalized or not capitalized? It doesn't matter. In this case, it was all four letters were capitalized. Uh, but it could be either way. And think about the letters. What what if you rearranged the letters? What would happen? Well, you have eggs. Yeah. So, and then uh, scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs. So there it is. That's interesting. <laughs> so it's an anagram that leads to it's scrambled a, eggs. Right. I I and like practicing is... anagrams because I used to play a lot of Scrabble. So that's all about solving anagrams. Right. Yeah, that is a, uh, I am a fan too. I, I didn't realize anagrams had this long, crazy history. So there were, uh, like Alexander the Great had a dream and this, he had a word in his dream and he didn't know what it meant. And he asked the soothsayers and they said, oh, well, if you rearrange the letters in the word, it means that you should attack this city. So anagrams have caused wars. Wow. Uh, and all sorts of other crazy things in history. So, so let me ask you a couple of questions. Like, first off, you were in this world jigsaw puzzle competition and I, and you described how the Russian team like destroyed everybody. And, and you guys finished one puzzle though. I mean, you had like, I think it was four jigsaw puzzles you had to do by the end of the day or. Right. It was, you had eight hours to solve four big jigsaw puzzles. And we got in there on a fluke because no one else from the U S had uh, applied, but there were 40 other countries and all of the other people would, you know, spend hours a day practicing and they were remarkable. They were like the LeBron James of, and their hands were just flying. They had special equipment to rip open the puzzles and it was hilarious and delightful. And the Russians, I am proud of myself because in the book, which closed long before uh, this Ukraine war, the, um, I said, I hate Vladimir Putin. I hate him for many reasons, but I got to meet these four women from Siberia and it was like jigsaw diplomacy, like face to face, you're both in in here doing jigsaws. And it was part of my thesis that puzzles are one way to unite the world to, to save humanity. So we'll see. That's like Uh, a theme of a lot of your books too. Like that's the, if everybody's a cousin, then right. we want to go to war with everybody. Although that's unclear also. But, so cousins uh, playing puzzles. Exactly. Yes, that's, and that's, get being grateful. Yes. That'll solve it all. And then delegating things they don't want to do. So <laughs> That's going to be but tough. What's a good strategy for jigsaw puzzles? Right. Well, jigsaw puzzles, uh, I was very skeptical of them. I, I was snobby in the beginning. It was one of the only puzzles I didn't love. 
But I was wrong. There are so many nuances to jigsaws. Uh, one is when you're faced with, we all do it usually by color, like looking for the color. But when you get to the top level, if you're faced with one color, like a big sky, then they will take the pieces and arrange them on a table. Here are the pieces with three knobs and one hole. Here are the pieces with two knobs and two holes and so on. And then you're able to do it very quickly. So that I loved. I loved that when you get to a certain level, you get very good at looking at the subtleties of the color. So take the sky again. Mm -hmm. The sky is not always going to be the same color blue. It's usually going to have shadings. So these people say, you know, nothing is black and white. That's the lesson. Everything is grays. So look for the subtle shadings of what's in the sky. Uh, and also hold up. This was a good one that I use a lot is when you're not sure if two pieces fit, then you can hold it up to the light and see if anything sneaks through any light. But it was just remarkable to see these people and how fast their hands moved. Uh, and uh, it and they must just... be so good at recognizing, like you say, like all the different patterns and shades and, and also looking at two pieces and seeing right away that they fit together. Uh, right. So, and what, what, uh, what, what's a good, what other strategies you learn? Did you learn? Like you mentioned a whole bunch of Sudoku strategies that I never heard of. Uh, and so just what's a good Sudoku strategy? Well, yeah, they had the crazy names like the flying X. I can't even remember them, but they're, I talked to one of the, I talked to several of the greatest Sudoku and Ken Ken players, by the way, are you Sudoku? And Ken Ken, or do you take sides? I've never played Ken Ken, and but I oh. but after reading about it, I've heard about it, of course, and after reading about it in your book, I now wanna I wanna try it. But Sudoku, I've done for a long time. Well, it is funny because there are people in each group that are like they hate each other. They're like the Jets and the Sharks. Like Su Ken Ken people look down on Sudoku people, and vice versa. Uh, but, I try not to take. But sense. just from the way you describe it, I would probably look down on the Sudoku people, even though I'm a Sudoku person. Like Ken Ken was like Sudoku <laughs> plus math. It like seemed a lot right. harder. It's got another element. Uh, well, Sudoku people have their other their their rebuttals to that, but I did. Um, I guess the strategy, again, it's you, you go, you can take the normal route of trying to find um, what's missing, or then you look at what you have and see. So you take it from both sides. I don't explain that very well, but, uh, but it's in the book. And I, what, I, what I loved about that chapter, if you might remember, is there's this debate in the... Uh, in the Sudoku and Ken Ken community about whether computers yeah. can create Sudokus as well as humans. And I love this debate because it's like, simp it's sort of a, a microcosm of are computers going to replace humans? Because the, the, the guy who invented Ken Ken, he says the computer generated Ken Kens are soulless. They don't tell a story. He says, mine are a work of art. He literally says, they're like a Michelangelo. They have soul. They have, I'm an artist. They tell a story. They have heart. And when I look at this one generated by a computer, it m means nothing to me. It's trash. Yeah. That, and I just that thought made that me was try, hilarious. Yeah. That made me want to try Ken Ken because Sudoku, I don't think that's possible. I don't, I think human generated and computer generated is probably, you can't tell the difference, but mm -hmm. it's my guess. I don't know. I could be wrong, but Ken Ken, I'm curious what he means because I could see how there could be some artistry to those problems depending on how you do the math parts of it yeah and i i hope he's right i hope he's right i'm a little skeptical uh but i hope there's still room for humans i mean gary kasparov when i brought this up to him because uh computers are of course better than humans at chess but they're also can solve chess problems that we can't like their chess problems are are structured so that it's like Mate in one means you have to move one piece and you'll mate the opponent. Mate in two is you move two pieces and you'll mate the opponent. There are problems where you have to move f 537 times to mate uh, black. And there's no way humans can do this. And 
Gary said he would he would he's watched machines solve these 537 mate problems and he has no idea what's going on for the first 400 moves. He's like, what the hell is the computer doing? And then it suddenly starts to make sense to him. Uh, so, but, but he is optimistic. He says machines and humans will work together in the future. We're not going to be taken over. And he is a lot smarter than me. So I guess. Well, also I, I like his quote. He's the first knowledge worker to <laughs> potentially be replaced by a computer. Cause he was the first world chess champion to lose to a computer. And, it kind of made people wonder, like, is that the end of chess? But of course, it's just like saying, oh, a car means you don't have to race anymore. <laughs> like you, <laughs> marathon should be over now because we could just drive a marathon. But that's like that's it. silly. And, and computers now are useful for training chess and for understanding strategies that humans previously, so it's improved the game because computers have introduced strategies that people previously thought were not so good. And it turns out they're better than people thought. But the problem is, is that people cheat. And so like you could go to a tournament and there's always a danger. Someone's cheating. And How do they cheat? Well, they might have, uh, you know, they're supposed to not do this, but they could potentially bring their phone into the bathroom and, you know, check oh. the computer and, or, um, or online cheating is rampant online. Like every day, if you play, online a lot, then the next day you'll see, oh, one of your games that somebody cheated. And so you get rating points back. And, oh. and but, if, if, but it's hard, you know, there's a lot of software to catch cheaters, but you can't make a hundred percent perfect software. Uh, and if someone could make great software, that would make like millions of dollars just cause it's such a big problem. That is so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cause there's money mm -hmm. at stake. If you, if in a lot of these online tournaments, you're playing for money, even in poker, there's, there's computers now are better than humans at poker and so much poker is online. If you have computer assistance, that could be very, you know, it makes it unfair to people who just want to play the game. So, right. so, but it is an interesting thing though, about whether the artistry could be recreated. I mean, now there's computers that make musical compositions that people can't tell if this is a Mozart piece or not. So, you know, eventually that artistry will be there if they just learn I to know. do that. Well, I'm, that's what I'm worried. I mean, are they going to, are they going to have fun interview podcasts by a robot, uh, that will replace the J, you know, James Altucher. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll 3000. Let's see. I will ask a question to an AI engine right now. That oh, will, good idea. okay. Uh, let's see. I, yeah. The question is, the first, the puzzle here is what question can I ask this AI right. that will give me a good answer? So questions I should ask about puzzles. I love it. All right. This is good. Uh, or, or let me see, let me, let me do it. what questions, uh, should I ask about puzzles? So, uh, and are you just doing is Google? Is that the robot? No. Uh, so again, this website I made to keep track of idealist notepad.com allows AI to finish your uh, oh. okay. So here's what the AI came up with. Okay. Wh what I'm is excited. The, what is the objective of a puzzle? Great question. AI, yeah. you are super good. <laughs> Can you kick out James? Cause we don't need him anymore. Uh, <laughs> Let's, oh, but, but, then, but then it asks also questions like what are the rules of the, so it thinks I'm talking about one puzzle. Uh, what else does it ask? Okay. What questions should I ask about strategies? What about riddle puzzles? I mentioned, Oh yeah, the strategies for solving, that's good. But you asked good ones about that. What about something we haven't talked about yet, like riddles or? Or how about this? What questions should I ask AJ Jacobs? <laughs> let's Ooh, see if it knows, yeah. let's see if it knows who you are. I like that. So it's hooked up to Google and the internet. Uh, how has your work as a human guinea pig affected your life? Thank you for asking AI an excellent question. Uh, well, it has made my life better overall, because I do think the the more experiments you do in life, the more interesting takeaways and they can be painful at times, uh, while you're doing them. But, uh, I love doing experiments. I'm actually doing one right now that, so just to pause on puzzles for a second, have you, what is your take on talking to yourself? James, are you a fan? Uh, you mean out loud or yes. Yeah. Out loud. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't do it. I, I don't think I've thought about it. I have a problem though, where I will 
if something's bothering me, I can't help but like blurt out what I'm thinking. Interesting. And but that's in public. Well, that's with other people, or that's yeah, with other people, yourself? I can't help it. And like my kids used to say, like if they had friends over and I would do that, like my kids used to have to tell their friends, like, oh, he just does that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh. Yeah, that is isn't. That is a whole other. That's another thing. But, so, but but tell me what you mean by talking to yourself, like like inspirational talking, like no, cheer up. I'm, I'm just no. I just instead of keeping my thoughts to myself while I'm alone, I'll just say them. I'll say, you know, I'm thinking about uh, what I should do over the weekend or what I should have for dinner, and the what I like. I'm trying it for a week, and we'll see if I keep it. But what I like about it is, a lot of times my mind will go to weird, dark, negative spaces uh, and, you know, mm. ruminate about silly things. Uh, yeah, I can't believe this guy didn't call me back. What, what an asshole. Uh, and then when I say it out loud and I hear myself, then I'm able to say, oh, you know, that's, that's a waste of time. Don't stop thinking like that. Stop, you know, stop being a sniveling baby. Uh, let's, uh, let's think of something more interesting. So that's that's the advantage. We'll see if it's worth looking like a crazy person. So here, um, here's what the AI says. I asked the AI, is it good to talk to yourself? And it says, talking to yourself can be a form of self-reflection, which can be helpful in order to understand and process your own thoughts and feelings. AI, and, and you process and I, them out loud. You and I are on the same wavelength, AI. I, you are good. I love that. I love the AI. So what, what puzzles did you enjoy the most? Well, I loved learning about new genres that I knew nothing about. So, uh, first of all, jigsaws, I didn't know that there were so many wild variations. Um, uh, I didn't know much about riddles and that's one of the things I liked writing the book is I got to include, there are hundreds of puzzles in the book, including new ones. Um, and a contest, which we can talk about at some other point, uh, like an actual contest secret in the book, and you have to find it. And if you solve it, you get $10,000, the first one to solve. And by the way, you don't have to buy the book. The, this, the code is in the introduction, which will be online at thepuzzler.com. So no purchase necessary, but, uh, but that is in the book. So anyway, I loved learning about new types of puzzles riddles I had never given much thought to, but I ran across these people who uh, spend their, their professors, like actual endowed professors who spend their lives analyzing riddles from the Middle Ages. And can I give you one? Yeah, I don't know yeah. if you remember this one, but this one is one of the ones that they uh, study. Because what's interesting is these were written in 1100 by monks but the twist is some of them are very, very naughty, like just super dirty. So, you know, it's still uh, still PG-13, but let me just tell you, here's the riddle. What am I? My stem is erect. I stand up in bed, hairy down below. An attractive peasant's daughter grips me, plunders my head, and feels my encounter. This woman with braided hair gets her eye wet. So what am I? <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of like dirty things it could be, I right. guess. Yes, but get your mind out of the gutter. I mean, that's the beauty of it. It is not a dirty answer because the, the monks wanted to trick you. They wanted to say, yeah. oh. Uh, so the answer is, I'll give you one hint. Yeah. The end, it says her eye. So when you're dealing with this thing, you your eye is wet, so you, you're crying. You're crying when you're dealing with this, and it's... Uh, but hair down below. Well, it's not... I mean, it's metaphorical hair, so it's like, you know, the stringy part of a certain vegetable that uh, oh. makes you... Oh, I don't know. Tell makes me. you cry. Tell me the what answer. Vegetable, what vegetable makes oh, you an cry? Onion. It's an onion. You got it with no hints whatsoever. No, but yeah. <laughs> You can see a milk <laughs> but uh, I don't. I didn't know an onion had hair down below. Well, if you see an onion that's you know not been processed, it's kind of got that stringy stuff. That assumes uh, 
I do any, see, I only see vegetables <laughs> in stores after they've already been processed completely. They've been processed, <sighs> they've been grown here, sent to China, processed, sent back here, <laughs> shipped to a grocery store, and that is the first time I lay eyes on them. So you're not a medieval monk. Okay, that is good to know. You know, you said something in the beginning when you were talking about the MIT puzzles, that the, the question arose, which is if these people are so smart, why are they wasting their time doing puzzles? And I think a lot about this because it seems like there are some activities where you're allowed to ask that question. Meaning, so let's say let's say you meet someone who all day long, that's what they do. They do puzzles. Will Shorts, all day long, he does puzzles and thinks about puzzles. So, you know, for some reason, it's acceptable to ask someone who, who does puzzles, uh, why are you doing this when you could it's just something kids do or whatever people say, but like then nobody asked this of like, you know, the marketing manager for Crest toothpaste, like, Oh, if you're so smart, like, why are you just doing marketing for Crest toothpaste? Like, I guess because a paycheck sort of is a, is a considered a valid reason. Like if you get a weekly paycheck or whatever, a regular paycheck, it's considered a valid reason to do something. Whereas puzzles, maybe someone is, is not making as much money as they could be because they love spending 20 hours a week doing puzzles. And I, I think about this a lot because lately I've been playing chess a lot. And of course you ask the question like, Oh, isn't that just a game? Like, why are you doing that? So I, I feel though that it's just a valid right. activity as anything else. Like what's, what's the problem I am with you? Well, first of all, I love that you're playing chess again. And as you know, and you can cut this out if you want, I want you to write a book, like what chess has taught me about life or why, why chess is good. Uh, cause I think that would be fascinating. No, and and I think I, it would sell. Yeah. And I think, I think what I've been doing, the whole process of coming back to it as an adult mm -hmm. that I will, I, and this is an AJ style book cause I'm immersing myself mm, in it that yeah. I will probably do. And also, you know, who also is really encouraging on this is uh, Robert Greene. He's like, Oh my God, this is an oh. amazing book. Like you have yeah, to do one. this. So, and he sold like, you know, millions more than me. So he knows what he's I, talking about. I don't know. About. You've, you've sold millions. You've sold your well, millions. You're nice. <laughs> uh, but I think it's a fascinating question and it's a, it's got a long history. Like you look, there have always been people who say every time that there's a puzzle craze, they're like, oh my God, I can't. When crosswords were invented in 1913, all of these newspapers were publishing them. But even back then the times was a little snooty and they refused to publish them. They thought it was too lowbrow. And instead they published articles. It is hilarious to see the articles in the twenties and thirties that crosswords were like a dangerous vice. They are like a reefer, like people were, um, you know, they caused arguments and breaks up of marriage, the murders, there were jailhouse riots. They covered people going blind from crossword puzzles. So it was like this panic, this moral panic about crossword puzzles. But now then they totally did a 180 and they, in 1942 started doing crosswords and now they're like the go-to place for puzzles. And I think you see this in every technology you see, you know, when books came out, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe they're going to ruin the world. We're even up to Google. Like everyone thought Google was going to make us stupid because, oh, you know, you don't have to know facts anymore. God forbid right. you didn't know like a, a fact and now you have to Google it. But you know, of course there's always the next evolution in thinking. Like you have to now understand the facts and use them wisely as opposed to just exactly. knowing exactly. <laughs> and same with puzzles. I think, uh, you know, quite the opposite from ruining our minds, they are uh, sharpening our minds. So there's always been this tension because even when puzzles started, like the first puzzle book of the 1600s was called sharpening the minds of the youth. So there's always this tension between puzzles, are the savior, the thing that's going to make us smarter versus the puzzles are what is going to turn our brains into oatmeal. But you know, I guess there's like, there's the potential to get obsessed with puzzles though, because they are fun and they do release dopamine and you could get addicted to that dopamine of, uh, oh, I solved another Sudoku puzzle. I got to keep going until I get harder and harder. And then, you know, you look at like Marcel Duchamp, who you mentioned in the book, famous artist <laughs> who's on his way to having like the most amazing artistic career on the planet. And at the age of 36, he basically retired for the next 30 years just to solve chess puzzles. I, I know. 
Right. That, like anything, it can be addictive. And once you get to that point, then it does actually harm your life. And there was, I mean, one of the most interesting characters I met was this guy whose last two years of his life were spent obsessing over a single puzzle. And it's a famously difficult puzzle. It's sort of a math logic puzzle. It's sort of like the uh, Monty Hall puzzle, which you probably know. Yeah. Where, um, uh, but it's like a thousand times harder and more complex. And it has, it has spawned 100 actual philosophy papers uh, that in real philosophy with, and it's called the sleeping beauty problem. I'm not going to give it because it's too, too weird and complicated, but if you Google sleeping beauty problem, just promise me you won't spend two years because this guy, he spent two years. He said he was staring at the wall for eight hours a day, thinking about it. And his wife was freaking out saying, you know, this is not good for you. It's, it's uh, all, it, that problem actually is almost worthy of an entire podcast because I am a hundred percent a halfer, and I know you're a thirder. You're a halfer. <laughs> I'm a halfer. Oh, wow! And I'm you know, you know why? And I'll just people should Google this problem, but I, so I won't take more than a minute on this. But tell me if you disagree. As opposed to the Monty Hall problem, where in the middle of the problem, new information is given, which changes the answer. There's no new information given in the Sleeping Beauty problem, so the odds remain the same as at the beginning of the problem. That is the perfect half or argument. And I still don't buy it. I still don't buy it because if you are told at the beginning of the problem, all of the parameters, then I still do think you would be a thirder. But listen, this is way over my head. I mean, these are people who uh, spend their lives, they're professional mathematicians, and they still argue about it. So you could be right. I don't know. Oh, oh, I guess I could see the third or side, which is that um, if she's asked what day it is, mm -hmm. then it's a much more complicated problem. And that's yeah. related to the odds. Like, then it's not so clear that, the, that she should treat it like a 50-50 situation. Well, one thing I love about that problem and some problems like it is that if you work at it, you can see both sides. And that is a, a, another important mental skill, being able to see the world from two different sides. And we talked about that on our mini show, Good or Bad, uh, how, to, yeah. how important it is to see the world from someone else's point of view. And flexibility, I mean, that is another huge theme of this puzzle adventure is cognitive flexibility. That's the only way you're gonna solve the hard problems. And I do Don't think- Don't become attached. Practicing, puzzles bill is good exercise like you are exercising that whatever muscle it is in the brain for cognitive flexibility like that is insanely valuable totally and so, and so like what's other like again i like i recommended earlier you have to do something to learn something but what's a good way people could think about how to how to be cognitively flexible uh well i do think puzzles are great practice uh but even when you're uh, when you're not doing puzzles, I, I think it's important to uh, assign a probability to your beliefs. Uh, and this is related to sort of Bayesian thinking. So don't say, you know, it is uh, when my wife, I actually do this maybe to the extreme. So if my wife says, calls me and says, what time are you going to be home? I'll say, there's a 60% chance I'll be home by seven but there's a 30% so I, home by. I feel like all of your books in part are methods for you to annoy <laughs> Julie, but, but then you have an excuse. Uh, this is what I, I'm getting paid to do this. I'm just exactly. doing this. And well, so you, you chose a career it's my that, job. that's just my designed job. to annoy your wife. So, well, you know that she did get like all these readers in emailed and said, you have to do a month where you, you do everything your wife says. So she did have that month a few years ago of like whatever it was, foot rubs and that's funny. And, and, uh, but but that is yeah, that's taking it perhaps to the extreme. But when you are looking at any complex issue, think in probabilities. Don't think in black and white and certainties and uncertainties. I, think I, in shades. I also like your re reverse strategy. So like 
do the opposite of what is expected. So for mm. instance, in the Gauss situation, he didn't add up the numbers in order. He came up with a completely unique way of adding these numbers up so that it becomes trivial to solve the problem. Or in, in chess, in a game, there's often like, there's one move. It looks like I just cannot make that move. And most people will never think about the move because you, you're not supposed to make that kind of move. Sacrificing your queen. Start by thinking of that move instead of just automatically discounting it. So, so this yeah. reversal thinking works in, in all sorts of puzzles. Absolutely. Yeah. Do the unexpected. Uh, as you say, in all types of puzzles, there's, uh, I covered Japanese puzzle boxes, which are these wooden boxes that sometimes cost thousands of dollars. And to solve them, you have to do what's totally unexpected. So, you know, you expect, you try to open it, just it's a box. You try to open the lid nothing so you have to do things like you have to spin the spin the box and and then it releases well, sometimes you have to freeze it that's another one that's crazy so uh sometimes it won't open until you freeze it so yeah do something that with the box that you never thought of yeah or or and like with 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 riddles or crossword puzzles it's never the obvious answer like like in the riddle you just said with the monks and the girl like you know, it's never the obvious, like, oh, this is a whatever. Right. It's a vegetable. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's a cookbook. You ever see that Twilight Zone? They're trying to. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> so that is, well, it has a lot, like you say, it has a lot to, of in common with great uh, stories and great fiction because that also has a twist at the end. Yeah. Actually, if you think about it, right, every novel is a puzzle because like the most obvious example being a mystery novel, who, who did it? And mm -hmm. the reader is constantly trying to figure out who did it by the end. And the challenge of the author is really like the same as the challenge of a puzzle maker, which is not make it too obvious, but not make it too difficult. But again, it's a, it's a fine line because you don't want them to figure it out until the author wants it to be revealed. So right. it's, it's a, it's a, and, and all mystery, basically the, the more interesting and, and, well thought out the mystery is in a novel usually the more successful that novel is so like right. the best mystery novels the one we do, we know best are by the authors who are the the best at making these puzzles right but what you said i think is so there's a sweet spot and the guy who made the puzzles for this book because they're 20 original puzzles very hard very interesting um he said the easiest thing in the world is to make a puzzle that's impossible that no one can solve uh and it's also pretty easy to make a, a totally simple puzzle that you got to find the sweet spot where it's just hard enough that you can solve it, but that you are given this challenge, this sort of, uh, period where you're frustrated. You're like, you're like, mm, and then you get to that revelation at the end. You know, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't, or maybe you did cover. I don't, I don't remember, uh, you know, like Google interview questions. Like Google kind of mastered the art mm -hmm. of asking puzzles as questions. And, yes. and they don't always expect the potential employees to have the right answers, but they want to see the thinking process. Right. Well, I did actually, it's not a major part, but I did talk about and give an example of Fermi problems, which is sort of the official name for a lot of the Google interview type questions where they ask, how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. And, uh, and the way to solve those is a very important tool for all types of thinking, which is if you, if you just take a wild guess, like, you know, 28,000, then it's going to be off by orders of magnitude, most likely. So the best way to do it is to break it down into small chunks. How many people live in Chicago? How many people on average, what percentage of people on average have pianos? How often do pianos need to be tuned? How many pianos can a piano tuner tune in one day? And then even if you're off on each of those guesses, the end is going to be closer than just a random guess. Well, this reminds me of a famous podcast we did, I believe in 2015 where, uh, and you, you would, it was based on a Facebook post you did, which went insanely viral. And, <laughs> and it was basically Ann Colt, you were watching some show, you were, you're obsessed with Ann Coulter and you're watching her on TV. And she said, something was said relating to Israel. And she said, well, how many 
effing Jews are there anyway? And she used the full word for effing. And, and you said, well, let's figure this out. How many Jews are having <laughs> sex right now around the world? And you, you use that exact technique and did this Facebook post and it got like a million shares and we did a podcast about it. That is so funny. I totally forgotten that that is a Fermi problem. Yes. Yeah. How many Jews are having sexual intercourse at, uh, at any given moment? Yeah. That is so funny. So, so look, AJ, uh, this is, I really enjoy this book, uh, cause a, it has all the AJ components of you sort of putting yourself in these crazy situations and then things happen. You're like, I, I don't want to use the word nerdy cause it's not that, but you're like, I am a proud nerd. I'm okay with that. But it's like, a, okay. It's like a nerdy version of what Hunter S Thompson does. So like <laughs> Hunter S Thompson will like load up on drugs, every drug possible, and then go to the democratic national convention and things happen. <laughs> you take yourself and your quirky personality. You don't need any drugs. You take your quirky personality and go <laughs> to the MIT puzzle solving competition, or you represent the U S in the jigsaw puzzle competition and, and on and on. And it's such a, it's such a great genre that you've mastered that you're, you're the only person and you're, you, you've uniquely mastered it. And it's always enjoyable to read your stories, but there's so much to learn. You always pack it in with so much knowledge, which, which what's clever about that is you give people many ways to like a story or like a book. So they might, maybe they like it. Maybe they're not interested in genealogy, but they want to see how you found, you know, the, did the world's largest family reunion and how you found all your cousins or, you know, or maybe they don't care about your story at all. And they want to read all about the history of all these different puzzles and strategies for doing these puzzles and interviews with the people who are the world champions of these puzzles. And so there's multiple ways for people to like your, your books. You are better at explaining my books than I am. Well, Thank I, I you. always try to break that down is... your, your approach. Yeah. Well, I listen, I can't wait for the James Altiger chess book, but in the meantime, yes, please. Uh, if you're interested by the puzzler or you can read the intro, uh, which I, uh, contains the secret code on the puzzler and, and, and I hope it's the intros and in, enough to make you want to actually buy the book and, and win $10,000 in the process. Potentially. Right. When exactly. are, are you going to announce a winner at some point or, uh, or is it just the first person who solves the puzzle? It is the first person who solves the, well, what happens is in the intro, the, um, you you have to figure out there's a passcode there's a a phrase that will be revealed in the introduction and it's hidden it's secret but once you do that then you actually have to put that passcode into a box in the puzzlerbook.com and that is your passcode to a a whole forest of crazy creative puzzles that I did not make that my friends from the MIT mystery hunt made. And they are hard, but they are fun and weird and fascinating. And the first one to finish all of those puzzles, there are over 20 of them. So you have to work for your money. Then that person gets the 10,000. This, this is, this is great. Such a great idea for a book too. Well, uh, good luck. We'll, we'll do, we should do a good or bad about puzzles as well. And our good or bad series. Sorry. And what can we let, I want, I'm, you got me going. I want to compete again on something like, is there a, a website we can compete on Sudoku? Like we could race to finish a bunch of Sudoku well, you're puzzles. You're going to kick my ass. I might not. I haven't Sudoku. played Sudoku in a while. No, but you've just got the mind. You've got the mathematical mind or the logical mind that is going to trounce me. I'll do it. I'll be embarrassed and I'll beg Jay to take, I, I think I could definitely, if I share my screen, I'm, I'm pretty decent at spelling V and all right, here I have spelling V. I haven't, I usually do it first thing in the morning, even in the middle of the night. Sometimes I'm going to have to try this. Is that the New York times site? Yeah. It's very addictive. Very, I don't want you to try it. I stay with chess cause you've got, you gotta write yeah, I got a book. book on I chess. got a book to write. Then I'll get obsessed with this. <laughs> exactly. But uh, all right. So, so what's the next book? It's not going to be about talking to yourself, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. That Could might be, be an might article. Be Who one. knows? Uh, I haven't decided. I have been still focused on puzzles. 
I'm always counting on you because you are an idea machine. So you're always giving me well, great ideas. The thing you should do though is you should now make some puzzle books. Mm -hmm. Like you should well, make. Well, that's right. You told me I had to do that. Yeah. To monetize. Yeah. Right. And that's like a no brainer because Will Shorts has written over 500 books of crossword puzzles, <laughs> Sudoku, and those are probably computer generated, some of them. Right. So exactly. And now you're going to have a brand name in the puzzle space. You should totally do puzzles and or make a puzzle right. site and maybe invent your own puzzles. Cause look, that guy who made Ken Ken, I, I wonder what he's worth now. Cause he like, you know, he basically created a whole genre of puzzle. I know he should be, maybe it was worth, well, he's, he's kind of like, he's funny. Cause he's kind of like a monk. All he cares about is the artistry. He doesn't care about money or so it seems. All right. Well, AJ say hi to Julie and the kids and we should definitely do a good or bad sometime soon. Maybe this month is getting pretty booked and you, and you have your, this book coming out on April 26, but let's plan on May doing some good or bads. Do, do we have any good or bads left to release? We have a couple. I'll have to listen to see if they <laughs> are releasable, but, uh, yeah, we might be able to squeeze a couple more, but I'm also up for doing new ones. If you yeah, are. Yeah, no, definitely. Cool. Well, all right, AJ, that thanks was so much. Blast. Really love the book. It was a really great book. Like, thank you. James. I'm thank excited you. to recommend it. So that means a lot. All right. Uh, all right. See you guys later. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Thank you.